Now what we're going to do is just quickly talk about the cutting board because actually having a great cutting board is really important. You want to have a good surface to work on. Now before we get into cutting board, we really want to make sure that it's safe and, safe and stabilized. So what happens is a lot of us have this issue where the board's sliding around on us. So what we're going to do now is stabilize the board to make sure that we have a really safe surface to work on. And whatever kind of board you have, this is a really great way to do it. What a lot of us tend to do is either get a paper towel or even a clean kitchen rag and just damp it lightly. Nothing, you don't need a lot of water on it, but just something that's slightly damp and put that underneath your cutting board. And by doing that, you create a nice little bit of suction that can actually now hold the board and lock it down, now being very safe. And especially when you have knives in your hand, you don't want your board sliding around on you. Now, I tend to prefer wood, a lot of us do, and uh, professionally, because even though wood seems like it's one of those things that's a little high maintenance, it's expensive, it holds bacteria, if you don't take care of your boards properly, they can all hold bacteria, all right? Even your plastic and fiberglass boards. But a lot of us tend to like wood because it can actually last a lot longer, but it also has some really great qualities to it. So if you've ever been to a butcher shop, you've probably seen that nice butcher block that's been there since like 1906. Not going anywhere, and it's gonna outdo all of us. But if you take care of the board, it will last forever, all right? So when you're dealing with a wood board, what happens is that whenever you're using a knife, whenever, whatever uh, the surface is, you're gonna get little nicks and scratches on the board. The more nicks and scratches that form, the more bacteria it can retain. The nice thing about wood is that you can always sand down the board, add a little mineral oil, and create a new safe, clean surface. So with plastic and fiberglass boards, one, most of them are not recyclable, so we're creating garbage. Two, they're not really repairable, you can't sand them down. And the bacteria resistant aspect of it is yeah it's not going to be able to retain it but because you can't clean up because you can't fix your boards and sand them down the more porous and more crevices they get the more bacteria can actually retain on the surface so like I said whatever the surface is you want to be able to take care of your boards and make sure it stays nice and clean so let's talk about the four basic cuts we're going to do our low cut high cut horizontal and pull but first let's get our hands on the knives and go over a little hand placement and safety because once you get your hands on the knives and you hold them correctly things start to change very very fast this is where the the confidence comes in and this minimizes the amount of cuts on on us not the food but it also now adds a little bit of speed and really can make things a lot easier for us so for basic hand placement what we want to do is we want to make sure that our three fingers are all the way up onto the choke of the knife like really up in the neck we can then drop our thumb onto the inside of the knife leaving our index finger to drop down the side, just like that. A lot of us love putting our finger on the back of the knife. This is actually a major problem. As soon as you start putting your finger on the back of the knife without even realizing it, you start pushing down. You start applying pressure. So now your hand gets tight, your forearm gets tight, halfway through a cherry tomato, and you're like, oh, I hate making salad, let's order in. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that our hands are nice and relaxed index finger drops down the side of the knife just like that and we have a nice relaxed grip this will actually stop that death grip that a lot of us love to get on a knife right because you get into it you get grab a knife you pick it up and you're just like die carrot right so instead what we want to do is try and keep things nice and relaxed nice and loose all right now once we have that nice grip on there what we like to do is make sure that we can hold our knife at about a 45 degree angle in front of us so the handle comes down usually towards the end of the board, and the tip of the knife is almost lined up in the middle at a nice angle like this. And for most of us, this is the same angle that we used to write with. So it's very much like a pen, right? And even if you're left-handed and you don't hold the pen like that, it is the pretty much the same angle that a lot of us type with. We try to keep everything nice and relaxed, and it's a natural angle to come down to almost form an X. And we're doing the same thing with the knife. Now once we, have our, uh, once we have our nice grip on the knife, what we want to do is actually slice. A lot of us love chopping, and this can actually pose some problems, cause things to get dangerous, and actually slow us down a lot. So using a piece of celery, I can kind of demonstrate this very easily. A lot of us, what we tend to do is put our finger on the back of the knife. We're scared of the blade, so we hold it back here, and we stick the knife straight out in front of us. We love using the tip of the knife, which now causes us to have to do things that look maybe a little bit like this. I am going to have some celery, some carrots, right? And we're feeding the food in like some weird conveyor belt. 
right? We're now sticking our fingers out. But now because, our fin because we're using the tip of the knife, we have seven to nine inches of very sharp steel above our hands. So now things are starting to get dangerous. We start feeding the food into the knife, right? Which is like doing this while trying to cut something. But now every time you push the food out, your fingernails come out. So you're starting to push the food in. It starts turning into a James Bond movie. We're like, oh crap. And then we're like one handed chop. That's a lot of work for a piece of celery. So the proper way to actually use the knife is to actually slice using a slow circular rotation, which means that it actually has three, it actually has three points. And a nice way to demo this is to actually bring your, once you have your nice 45 degree angle, to actually bring your knife up to the tip. But you'll notice my shoulder's nice and relaxed. A lot of us tend to do things like this and get things really out of whack and it makes us do a lot of work. All we're really doing is using our, our wrist and our elbow, nice, slow, circular rotations. Um, by taking the knife, I'm nice and relaxed, no death grip, and I just push the knife forward, rolling the heel down to the board, point one, and that's your actual slice. Point two, we bring the heel back up to the tip, and then three, we pull back. And that circular rotation is pretty much how the knife works. Now, a lot of us do love to chop, and I don't know if you've ever tried to chop parsley or cilantro, things like that, right? You got a nice knife in your hand, and it's cutting through paper or whatever, and you're just chop, 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 chop. You may move everything over and see a nice green line and all those nice little pieces of parsley, cilantro, because technically the knife can't chop. It doesn't really work. So slicing is key. This is like cutting a piece of bread. You want to use a nice circular rotation. So when I pick the knife up, all I'm really using is the back half of the knife. Like I said, a lot of us love using the tip, but the safety, the speed, the accuracy of your cuts, all of this come from actually using the back half of the knife. So instead of using the tip of the knife, we're gonna start at the heel and just gently bring that knife up and pull back and only as use as much as I need. Without applying any pressure, I can push forward and let the heel sink right in, point one. Two, bring the heel up, and three, pull back. Circular, clean, safe rotations. So if you're having your dinner party and you're cutting things like this and your friend is like, what are you making, and bumps into you, you can see this poses a lot of problems. Whereas if you have everything nice, safe, and controlled, something happens, knife goes down, keeping it very safe, right? Now once you have the safety, the speed, the accuracy, all of that come into play. Now there is one other little trick that we need to do, and this is actually very important. A lot of us are used to feeding the food into the knife. And every time you push the food in, you're gonna get different shapes and sizes, doing a lot of different things, right? Getting a lot, doing a lot of motions, and it gets a little, little crazy. So the actual proper way to use the knife is to actually keep the food perfectly still. The knife has to come down the food. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of a step to this. It's a little like parallel parking, but a lot easier, I promise. All right? And I've got a little trick for you that actually really, really helps. We keep our circular rotation, but now what we're going to do is we're going to bring the handle in and kind of pivot. And then when you pull the knife back, you straighten it out. So it looks a little bit like this. And like I said, I have a nice shortcut for you. So one thing that we love to do is actually use this piece that sticks to the side of the knife. I know this drives a lot of us crazy. We even buy knives with the little dents in them to release the food. Not really necessary. And this is actually gold. When you're, learning to, when you're trying to learn how to use the knife, this is actually a great way to kind of use as a template to find your next cut. And here's what I mean. I'm gonna take the knife and make my first cut, point one. Two, bring the heel up. But then on three, I just pivot the heel in. And by bringing it in, I can take the knife and pull back using the piece that's stuck to the side as a template, line it up and push forward and get a nice uniform cut. One, two, bring it in, pull back, line it up and forward. And that gets me nice, clean, uniform pieces. Now we like uniform pieces because one, they look nice, but two, they cook evenly. So this is really a great way to do this. So go slow, take in the technique, and like I said, speed comes later. Now, if you don't f um, pull the knife back and straighten it out correctly, you may end up with something like this, which is also very common. And this I see a lot. 
right? So now your first cut may look something like this, and your last cuts look something like that. If this happens to you and you throw these into a pan, this is going to be mush, and this is going to be raw in the same cooking time, changing the flavors, the textures, and the whole thing's unbalanced. So we really want to try and keep things nice and uniform and keep them nice and clean. Now another really important thing is safety of the guide hand because this is key. This is the hand that gets hurt, the one that's holding the food. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we have a proper grip on our celery or whatever we're cutting. So one, what we like to do is make sure we keep those fingertips in. So we bring them in so that just the first knuckle is sticking out. The other three fingers now pinch the side, keeping our thumb nice and safe and everything nice and in, like a nice little claw, just like that. By doing this, if, if your fingernail comes out and that knife comes up an eighth of an inch too high, that fingernail is going to grab the blade and drive it right in down to the bone. So by keeping that fingernail tucked in, I can now get actually a full inch of leeway without getting cut. And there's no reason for my knife to ever come up this high. So the only motion that this hand makes is that as the knife is zigzagging down the food, kind of like parallel parking, these two fingers are just gently pushing the hand back inchworming away from the knife. That gives chefs the ability to now line things up and start slicing. And then you're like, wow, and you have to look at what I'm doing anymore. You can get nice, fast, clean, and safe. Now, once you have a couple pieces built up, you can always just push down with the blade so that you don't get cut, not like this. I know that looks awesome. Doesn't look awesome when that finger curls and you lop it off into your stew. So you want to actually just push down just like that. Now a lot of us love dragging the blade across the board to clean it off. This can ruin your knife almost immediately. So the best thing you can do is actually use the back of the knife. Clean it all off to the side and reset. Don't let the food tell you what to do. You're the one with the knife. So move everything off to the side, reset, and make your cuts. Keeping it nice, safe, and clean. And this will all go back into our stock. Make some soup later. So now we're gonna go into a high cut. Now, high cut's pretty much like the low cut, but it, adds, it actually gives us a little bit more leverage to be able to get into some of the bigger, harder items. Pretty much the grip is the same. The rotation of using the knife in a nice circular rotation is really what we want to do. Keep that knife moving. But if I try and do a low cut for something that's a little bigger, like a carrot, parsnip, celery root, you may find yourself needing to use a little bit more knife. So doing the low cut doesn't really work very well. We want to get in with a little bit more knife. If I try and get into this carrot using a low cut and I need five to six inches of steel, you can see my shoulder and my elbow are up. So now I'm out of my league. I'm dealing with something that's round that can slide on me, which is now dangerous. But it also now means any time that you see blade that can be above your fingers means you run the possibility of getting cut. So we want to eliminate this. So all we do is bring the knife up off the board. And by bringing it up off the board, I can now pull back. I can get, keep my arm nice and relaxed got a nice little slant on the blade using a slicing motion and I can actually now just take that push forward and slice all right, without any resistance which is really nice now the other nice thing about the high cut is that it can get pretty big you can go pretty big on this this is good for your carrots parsnips celery root pineapple butternut squash you can even get into a good size watermelon without having to come in at it like a Spartan warrior and try and split the thing in half you have full control almost up to your neck by just using your wrist and your elbow so if you ever have trouble of things rolling around on you all you really have to do is take your pinky and thumb and drop them down to the board creating little parking blocks now keeping things nice safe and stabilized again keeping your fingertips in, your knuckles sticking out, and now you have full control to be able to pick up that knife and again push forward. Now a lot of us get to this point where the knife actually gets stuck, right? And the first, for some reason, our gut reaction is to take the knife and start being like, hell no, and start pushing down on it. This is where things can slip and you can get hurt. So what we want to do, like cutting a piece of bread, if anything ever gets stuck, instead of trying to push down and chop, is to actually take the knife, pull back, and slice. Make a second cut. Remember, the knife is designed to slice, not chop.
So now let's play around with some of our techniques. We can actually use some of these to actually now do some plateaus, juliennes, and brunoises. I like using these techniques because this is really a great way to really get a feel for how the knife is supposed to work. And you can do a little bit of fine tuning on here and do nice little dices and matchsticks, which really kind of bring everything together. And you, like I said, really understand how the knife works. Now, a lot of us still maybe have gone through something like this, where we try to chop something and do a high cut. High cuts are pretty common. We've brought the knife off the board before, but maybe that looked a little bit like this. All right, you get a nice cut like that. You just ruined your blade. You ruined all your equipment. Maybe your pinky was sticking out, and that's how we get hurt. Now, like I said, the knife is not designed to chop. So as soon as I start feeling like I have to apply pressure and you start shaking, this is a problem. So what we want to do is, again, use a slicing motion. Two fingers come up on top, no fingers down the side, like a nice little peace sign, just like that. Two fingers up on top, knife comes up high. Now for the high cut, I do need a little bit more blade, but I do not want to roll into the tip. By rolling into the tip, you can tell the knife flattens out a little bit, so I want to stay in our sweet spot, right, keeping it from chopping. So I take the knife and gently push forward, and the knife slides right in. You can turn that 90 degrees, do that again, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees. So now we have our four sides. Four is what we're going for. This will give you a nice clean edge to work with, and now we can go into our plateaus. So our plateaus, we take our two fingers and rest them on top. Other three fingers stay behind. This actually, by curling those fingertips in again, I can now keep my knuckle on the inside of the blade and actually use that to guide my next cut. Pull back gently, not going into the tip of the blade again. We're staying in our sweet spot and then push forward. If for whatever reason the knife gets stuck, don't fight it. Just pull back and make a second cut. But as you practice this, one cut should be just fine. Now as you're doing this, you'll start noticing that the block that you're holding on to is going to start getting very wobbly, very awkward. So only go as far as you feel comfortable. As you start practicing this, this will be your last cut. That's what you'll be holding on to. You'll move into that slowly. So just hold on to whatever you feel comfortable with. Otherwise, you can snack on it and be your crudité and give it to the dog. They love carrots or go ahead and throw it into a stock. Now, once we've got our stack of plateaus, just take two or three of them. Don't try and do a stack of 10. You'll spend more time trying to hold them together. And they've actually got a lot of sugar and water in them, so they're going to start creating syrup. So now what we can do is take our two fingers and rest them on top. We may start feeling like we need to do a low cut, but we're actually going to stay with the high cut because this now brings in some speed and a little bit, of, a little bit more accuracy with it. So what we're going to do is bring them up just a little bit, the carrot may curl or bend a little bit. You can always use your pinky and thumb to push them so they flatten out a little bit. Take your knife, bring it up, and using the high cut, we're just pushing forward again. Use the pieces that stick to the side of your knife, like the celery, and actually use them to now create your nice little juliennes, your matchsticks. Once you have a couple of your matchsticks, you can take four or five of those, line them up, and now you can go back to your low cut. But your low cut is no longer this. Your low cut is just four or five, two to three fingers on top using your thumb, middle finger, and index, just like that, and inchworming back, staying away from the knife and using just the heel to add a little safety. And you now can get your nice little dice, your brunoise. So there's your plateaus, your juliennes, and your brunoise. All right, so let me just clear some of this stuff off and we'll throw it into the stockpile. So let's talk now about the infamous onion. This is the one that really slows a lot of us down, makes us cry, very mean, right? There's some things that we actually can do with an onion to actually keep some of that resistance down. Now, some of us are more sensitive than others, so there's nothing that's 100%, unless you're wearing goggles or something like that. Not always the best thing on date night, but if you're into goggles, go for it. Um, otherwise, there are some things that we actually can do by using proper knife techniques to actually keep a lot of that spray down.
Um, one, having a sharp knife. This is key. Two, slicing. And slicing is all about how the knife works. So let's take an orange, for example. If you've ever taken an orange peel and squeezed it and you see the juice spray everywhere, onions are the same way. They're 80% water. So if you take a knife and start trying to chop into it, rip, tear, spray, and cry. Because it's actually about the acidity, that moisture making contact with our eyes. Now there is something else that we actually can do, um, which actually help a lot. But it's not in the knife. It's actually in the onion itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down and um, show you how to, how to really look at the onion properly. And once you understand the onion, this will really help if you are sensitive. So the claw grip is really what we want to be using. We want to make sure that our fingernails are tucked in, keeping that, finger, that uh, first knuckle sticking out, just like all our other cuts, making sure that everything is nice and safe and secure. A lot of us love holding the onion like this, and that just moves around. I don't like the way that feels. So I want to make sure I'm above the blade. Always keep your fingers above the blade, and I'm going to just take my knife and using a high cut, all I'm going to do is push forward and get a nice clean edge. Now I have a nice flat edge to work with, now making it very stable and safe. Onion skins and such, great for stock, so I'm throwing that in there. Now I can take my knife and drop it right into the root of the onion. Again, a lot of us love holding the side of the onion, but what we're going to do to make this a little safer is actually take our middle finger and thumb and arch it over the back of the knife. And using this arch grip, I can now then have equal pressure on both sides of the onion, keeping it safe, and if the knife starts to slip, I can get out of there very quickly. So now I can take my knife, again using a high cut, staying to the back half of the knife, pushing forward, and slice. Now once it's in, it's safe. If you feel like you didn't get to go through all the way, don't fight it. Remember, once the knife is flat and we're chopping, that's when we get resistance. So instead, pull the back, make a second cut, get a nice clean edge. All right. Now, there's no really great techniques for peeling. I apologize. You're just going to have to do that. But you ever notice that when you peel an onion, sometimes you get like this weird silky skin? Whatever you do, do not try to cut that. It's not worth it. You're not going to gain any amazing flavor from it. All you're really dealing with is something that's uh, very slippery and very fibrous. So either your fingers can slip, your knife, or both. So just take your fingers, roll that silky skin out of there, throw it into your stockpile, get rid of it. You just don't need it. It's not doing anything for you. Now, another thing is, like, as, like I was saying, is if you are sensitive to onions, here's really a nice technique, and understanding the onion can help a lot. And this will help keep some of that tearing down. A lot of us love our half moons, so we take our knife and we cut our half moons, right? for salads and things like that, getting our nice little juliennes, which is awesome. They look great. But you ever notice that when you cut into an onion, almost immediately there's moisture buildup? If you look at the way the onion's actually designed, the natural grain goes up and down, not left and right. So when you cut against the grain, you damage more cell walls, releasing more moisture and seen. We all start crying, right? So instead, what we can do is we can move all that stuff over. And if you're cutting up into, if you're cutting into an onion and you feel like it's, it's a little much, what you can do is just cut a little bit off the end, a little bit off the side. Those can go into your stockpile or get rid of them. And now, taking my knife, I can cut with the grain. Still getting my nice little juliennes, right? And if you can see, there's the edge of the, the against the grain that I just cut, and there's moisture buildup. You can see there's even a little white water, and there's with the grain, virtually none. So you can actually make it through six or seven onions without even really smelling it. Now, once you actually get, start getting into it, I always see people get about halfway down their onion, and then all of a sudden, their fingers start dropping below the blade. And it's that awkward moment of that one-handed chop again. So if that ever happens to you, you ready for this? This is amazing. All you got to do, turn the onion. That's it. You want to say that again? Just one more time? Just, there you go. So now as soon as you start feeling like things are getting dangerous, adjust, come up high, and you can now get nice clean cuts, keeping those fingers in. All right? So that's basically understanding the onion. So let me clear this board off, and now we're going to go into the next two of the four major cuts, and we're going to really break down this onion and get them into a nice dice. So let's pick up this next half of the onion and do the last two of our four major cuts. Again, just getting rid of that skin. Never serve anything you wouldn't eat yourself. 
So let's start with our horizontal cut. The horizontal cut's probably the most awkward, but this is not a dangerous cut. This is the one that's a little scary to a lot of people. But once you understand the knife and you understand not applying pressure, just slicing and using the knife correctly and keeping your guide hand safe, really it's, hard to, it's really hard to get hurt. So let's start by bringing the onion down to the edge of the board. This is actually key because now what I can do is take my knife and drop it down flat with my handle hanging off the board. If you try and do this cut in the center of your board, you'll notice that your hand now takes up a lot of, a lot of space and you're not, as gonna get, you're not gonna get as many cuts. Whereas by bringing everything down to the edge, I can now get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 15 horizontal cuts if I want. So by bringing it down to the edge, I now have my leverage but now, a lot of us tend to try and hold the onion like this. I've even seen professional cooks doing this. The problem with this is that with your fingers dropped down, if that knife slips, you can end up in here. And you really don't want to do that. So we want to make sure our guide hand is nice and safe. We bring our claw grip now to a nice little beak and rest it on top. A lot of people like using their palm of their hand, but only do this once you understand the technique, because too many times I've seen things happen where their hand slips. So let's make sure that our fingers are as far away from the knife as possible. Now the horizontal cut is not really that different from anything we've been doing. Our low cut, knife never left the board. Our high cut, same circular rotation, but now the knife comes up off the board. This time, we're just gonna take the cutting board completely away and now do the same thing, but going sideways at a 90 degree, all right? So what we do is this. We line everything up and bring the knife up off the board. We wanna make sure that the knife is nice and flat. If any part of your knife is touching, you're gonna to get these lumberjack cuts and everything can start slipping and now it becomes dangerous. So what we wanna do is make sure that everything is nice and flat, horizontal as much as we possibly can be. We then take the knife and gently pull back. And if I lift that up, when you look at it, that's very much like our high cut. Except this time, we're just turning everything sideways. So I'm not going into the tip of the knife. Way too much knife, things can slip. And because of the bend in the knife again, we're actually going into a little bit of a chop. So we wanna make sure that everything is nice and flat and pull the heel back. Using that sweet spot on the knife, our back half, I can take it and gently push forward, rolling the heel down, just like the low cut and the high cut. So I can take it, push forward, and sink it in. Now once the knife gets stuck, don't fight it. This is that point where a lot of us start being like, well, why can't I whittle the knife in? And then we start pushing the knife into the onion. And then we start pushing the onion into the knife. And then the pinky drops. And then the thumb drops. So instead of applying pressure, like I said, always make sure, like cutting a piece of bread, if it doesn't go through, we pull back and make a second cut. And I'm already halfway through. Now, if this is your safety, if this is your, your comfort zone, don't go outside of it. Just do, half, just do halfway through the onion. That's fine for now. But if you wish to go one more, go ahead, take the knife, pull back out, and go three quarters through. But because there's no cutting board to stop the knife, our only true safety net is to make sure we do not cut through the back of the onion. So leave the root intact, all right? As you practice this, you'll be able to get almost all the way down to the very end and utilize the whole thing. But for now, let's just go about three quarters through. Take the knife out, come back up, and we'll do another half inch and pull, push forward and drop. Now, like I said, it never has to be done in one cut, so you can always do one, two, three, four, and you can, as long as your knife is slicing, you'll be all right. The other key is to make sure we're not crushing the onion. Don't try and kill it. That's gonna cause more friction, making it dangerous. So you're just trying to hold it still, and then let the knife slide through. Very, very gentle. And as you're practicing this, just make sure that with every cut, your fingers aren't starting to slip. So you can bring it back up and go one, check, two, check, three, and eventually you'll just start getting right through. Now what we have are nice little horizontal cuts. We have our nice little plateaus like our carrots. I can now then take the onion and turn it, butter the onion facing away from me, and this is the fourth and last cut. This is the, the, uh, the other major cut that we wanna learn how to use, and this is called a pull cut.
Now, everything that we've been doing has pretty much been straight lines, right? Up and down, forward, rolling that knife, and just getting that nice circular rotation. Keeping the tip down and rolling the heel to the board. This cut's a little different. It's actually reversing. So what we're doing is we're bringing the knife down so that the heel is on the board, tip of the knife is in the air. And by bringing that up, I can actually now pull the knife through and let it roll down. The trick to using this cut is that it is a low cut, which means that the knife needs to just stay on the board at all times, which means there's always a point of impact. So the knife is actually kind of rotating, staying on the board, all right? So if I take the knife and rest it on top, remember we do not want to cut through the root of the onion, so I'm just going to take the knife and gently pull back and let it sink in. Without applying much pressure, I can come in and just let the tip of the knife reach the back of the first cut. Then I can add a little pressure onto the back of my knife and just roll the belly down to the board, getting a nice clean cut. So I'll do that again. Pull back, let it ride, let it ride, and roll the belly down. Now I know a couple of us have tried this before. Oh yeah, there's always a little bit of shrapnel. That's okay, it's not you, it's the onion. So that just goes off to the side, okay? Now I know a lot of us have tried this before, but maybe it looks something a little bit more like this, right? Stab, chop, pull out, cry, chop, cry, right? So instead what we're trying to do is just let that knife slice, keeping the resistance down, not ruining our blades, and letting the knife do all our work. Right? Now aside from a couple pieces that may slide out, which are totally fine, right? we now have our nice little Julianne's. We now have our nice little um, clean matchsticks. So the other nice thing about this technique is that by doing this we've made two major cuts. Both of them have been with the grain of the onion, so I've released virtually no moisture. What moisture I have released is almost fully intact, aside from a couple pieces off to the side. So now I can do that 10 minutes ahead of time, leave it off to the side, do my carrots, my garlic, my steak, get everything else ready, and then when I'm ready to get into the onion, I can pull back, come up, and do a high cut, and dice. If you try and chop at this one and push down, the onion opens up like a flower and it starts going all over the place. By keeping a nice slicing motion, everything just falls apart for me. All right. Now what's the worst thing we can do to an onion? And it's what we all do, right? Chop, 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 rip, tear, cry, cry, rip, tear, cry. So if you need to go smaller than this, bring everything together and low cut, no resistance, no spray. So by using the knife as a nice slicing motion, whether it's like cutting a piece of bread or even a two by four with a saw, it's all about that slicing motion. Keeping it again safe, clean, and getting a nice clean cut, utilizing more food. You'll also notice that I use the chef knife for all of the techniques. So really the, knife, the chef knife is pretty much key to understanding how all knives work. So let's play around with some garlic and shallots. These are pretty much going to be using some of the same techniques that we've already done, but now it's going to require a little fine tuning. Also, garlic is one of those things that tends to slow people down a lot, partially because of the skin. So much so that a lot of us will even buy pre-peeled or pre-cut garlic. Not really necessary, and honestly, it actually can lead to a lot of problems and getting totally ripped off because you're paying for this process, getting less flavor, packaging, so on. So getting a whole head of garlic is totally fine. Now, um, I don't know, when we play around with garlic, maybe it looks something like this. Maybe this looks familiar to some of you. Maybe, right? What do we like to do? We like to not deal with the skin. So we take our chef knife, right? And we cut a little bit off the end. Just a little bit there, right? And then we smash. We're like, all right, great, got the skin off. But as soon as you do that, you gotta remember garlic is primarily oil. And as soon as you crush it, right? Even just a little bit, you'll see I have now garlic oil buried into my board, right? And there's also a little bit of oil buried on the side of my knife. So now I've just lost a bunch of flavor, right? So then what would we do? We get the skins off, which is cool. We don't have to deal with that, but we just lost a bunch of flavor. 
then what do we do? We spend the next couple minutes doing things like this. Chop, 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 rip, tear, right? Bearing more flavor into the board, right? Then we're like, well, let me get that out of here. So now we have garlic all over our fingers. So now we smell like garlic, right? We ruin our knife. And then we repeat. By the time you get through this, we've now lost so much flavor. We smell like garlic, and we've ruined all our equipment by chopping and dragging the blade across the board, killing the teeth on it. So then we end up with a nice little mashup like this, right? Which is fine if you're making a soup stew or chili or something like that, fine. But if you're making a vinaigrette and someone gets that piece, by the time you get to chocolate mousse, they're still eating this. This is all they've eaten for three courses. So instead of doing this technique and now finding yourself having to use four or five cloves of garlic, what you can actually do is switch out to your paring knife. And your paring knife can actually help get you in there a little bit more. Now if you are actually are gonna be using a lot of garlic, if you do like lots of garlic, I don't wanna take that away from you, but if you're gonna be using a lot of garlic, here's a nice little technique that can actually peel all the garlic for you. Um, before we get into the paring knife, we'll just go come back to this guy for a second. Take your knife and take a, using a high cut, just take a little bit off the root of the garlic. If it feels like it's getting stuck a little bit, you can rotate and turn and just take a little bit off. If you get a big root on your garlic, just come up a little higher and it should be fine. You just want to make sure that you're slicing, not chopping. Now that bottom part can go into your stock or you can use that for whatever you want, but usually we don't like to use that much. So now you can take some of those skins, those loose ones, which will come right off and get those into your pile as well. Now what you can do is you can actually take your head of garlic and start breaking it up. If some of the root still feels a little intact, once you've broken it down, you can now then come up and get the rest of that and break that apart. So once you've got some of your garlic broken up into a nice metal mixing bowl, metal's usually best because it actually helps, um, it's light and it actually helps stay together. Don't do this with glass bowls, all right? Good, good point right there. Um, now what we're gonna do is actually get all our garlic into the metal bowl. And by doing this, I can now match it with another size or another bowl of the same size and just cover. And by doing that, I can just give it a nice couple violent shakes and And what you'll end up with is peeled garlic. The skins start breaking and falling right off. So now once you have some peeled garlic, you can take the rest of those skins, go get those into your stockpiles, and you've got nice peeled garlic. You can throw them into a Tupperware, throw them in the fridge, and you got them for the next four or five days. And then you don't have to peel each one at a time. Now once you have your peeled garlic, what we're gonna do now is kind of revisit some of those uh, techniques that we did with the chef knife. But getting into something like garlic with your chef knife, it can get a little shady. It's a little small, and this is a pretty big size knife. So what we're gonna do is actually use our paring knife. The garlic comes down to the edge of the board. So now using our four basic cuts, I can now do our horizontal, our pull, our high cut, and low cut, and get nice minced garlic without losing a lot of oil onto the board. So I can bring everything down to the edge. Three fingers now rest on top of the garlic and pretty much the same grip that we use for our chef knife. Index finger on the side, thumb on the side, and other three fingers in. So again, never applying pressure on the back of the knife. And just taking that, I can come up and do my horizontal. Now I don't have to use big circles for this like we did with the chef knife, but what we can do is just slice back and forth and get a nice clean cut about three quarters through. Come up, do another one, and then another one. And you can make as many as you want, but usually two or three is gonna be fine. Bring that to the center of the board, and now using your pull cut, just pulling that knife through down to the board, because we don't wanna cut through the root, I can get nice clean cuts and drop that right on in. I actually have worked in restaurants where uh, we had 150, 200 seats, where we had to do this for all our garlic. Now once you have that nice little checkerboard cut up, like we did with our onion, you can switch out to your chef knife and you're already here. And once we have our nice little minced garlic, 
We have even distribution, which means no one's getting that big chunk stuck in the back of their throat. And using proper technique, I can now get a nice, fine, even distribution. We all know a little bit of garlic goes a long way, using less product and creating more flavor. So now what we can do, is another one that's, uh, that a lot of people have asked me about is shallots. And shallots is pretty much the same thing. So what we can do is get, take a shallot using your chef knife, cut a little bit off the front, and just like the onion, dropping down to the side making sure everything's nice and safe, and using a high cut. Now pretty much shallots are a little bit like small onions, right? They are related to garlic, but they are pretty much cut the same way as an onion. But again, we're gonna use the paring knife. Bring everything down to the edge, two, three fingers on top, and then come up high and just slice. Now shallots are awesome. I love them in salads and other things like that. Um, sometimes more than onions. They're a little sweeter and you don't have to use as much. They got a nice little bite to them. And when you're just, and I even use them in pasta sauces a lot. So again, using my pull cut, making sure that the knife rolls onto the board. If you don't let that knife come all the way down to the board, you end up having to chop and then cry. So by just making sure that that blade rolls all the way down, we should be able to get all the way through. And then again, switch out to our chef knife and nice clean dice. And that's how you do a shallot. So we've done garlic and shallots. And now that we understand our basic knife techniques, why don't we start visiting some of those items like butternut squash, pineapple, tomatoes, jalapenos, things that can be a little scary or even slow us down by just doing some nice little shortcuts. So let's get started on that in the next lesson. So what do you do when you don't have a bottle opener and you're getting stuck on the grill like I usually am? Normally I have my knife on me, so this is one of those things that I like to use really quick. So if, I'm, if I need to open a beer because I'm just grilling all those burgers and stuff, what I'll do is I'll grab my chef knife, use, it for some, use my knuckle for some leverage, and place it right on top. Using a knife, you want to just make sure that your fingers are not dropping below the blade. So just make sure it's nice and wide. And then just very easily, using a little leverage, That pretty much keeps me in business and you can get your own.